Hello Year 12 and welcome back to the college. Uh, for those of you who knew, my name is Mr. Flynn and I'm the Head of Academic Enrichment. As part of your induction today, I'm going to be talking to you about the value of enrichment. I'm going to be telling you what that is and why it's so important to you. And in today's screencast, we're going to be covering some of the following things. We're going to be looking at the purpose of education, why you are here, what is it that universities are looking for, and why is it that curiosity and passion are very, very important to them. And as part of this little lecture and lesson, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the philosophy of education. And I'm going to be looking at two very famous Greek philosophers. And hopefully you'll see their value and how clever some of their ideas are. And I'm going to be linking this to the idea of education as a form of enrichment. And then I'm going to move on to talk about why it is that universities and employers so often speak of the value of what they call critical thinking. I'm going to tell you what critical thinking is, and then more importantly, I'm going to show critical thinking in action by applying it to a case study of the issue of IQ tests. I'm going to sh watch a short video from TED Talks, which I think you'll find very, very valuable. And then I'm going to tell you why it is that enrichment widens your skills, your academic skills, and how these skills go well beyond testing and examinations, and why it is that enrichment is quite unique in offering you what we could call real-world learning situations. And most importantly, I'm going to be emphasizing how education should be a joy, it should be a pleasure, and how enrichment can actually make your classes and your whole sixth form ex experience a far more interesting and engaging one. Now I'm going to switch my camera off because I'm sure that you don't want to see me for the whole of the day. Now, as our starter for today, I'm going to ask you to have a group discussion, and this is obviously going to be led by your tutor, and I'm going to be asking you to think about and consider the question, what is education for? I put together a number of reasons we might give, things like a preparation for future living, to learn exam skills, to give people hope, etc. What I would like you to do is to pause this uh, particular screencast now and to have a discussion for at least five minutes and maybe to try to rank some of these things and decide what do you think is the most important reason why we become educated. I'm going to pause that now and give you some time to discuss this. Now some of you may hope that I'm going to give you some of the answers here. But of course I'm not. This is a classic open question, a subjective question. And something like education is incredibly problem problematic and incredibly subjective. Some of you may feel that the most important thing in schooling is to learn examination skills. Others might believe that the most important thing is to instill positive behavior. You might believe in character education. What kind of citizen is going to be produced? And I want you to engage in this debate so that you can just see how complex the project of education is. But what you may have got out of it is to realize that education is more than numbers. You are more than a set of examination results. And whilst it would be wrong of me to downgrade the importance of, of examination results because universities and employers do treat them very, very seriously. I have to remind you that the project of education is so much more than the numbers that you are given at the end of that education. As human beings, we have so many skills that go beyond this. Creativity, character, morality, resilience, the ability to work independently, now, I don't want to get bogged down in an argument about whether examinations actually produce and test these qualities, but I think it's fair to say to all of us that we recognize that there are aspects of us as people that seem to go beyond the numbers that we are given. And I am a huge fan of an educational writer whose name is Arthur Costa. 
who wrote an incredibly influential book called Learning and Leading with Habits of Mind. And what Art Costas says in this book is that beyond our examination results and how we perform in all forms of assessment, there are kind of habits, habits like being very resilient, habits like independence of mind, which have extreme value and which schools should target and nurture. And these include things like ethical conduct, being a good human being, having decent values, cultural com uh, competence. Those of us who've grown up in international schools, as many of you have here, will know how important it is to be able to relate to other people who come from different cultures, religions, and linguistic groups. Citizenship. What are we actually going to do in our country? Mindfulness. Things like do we understand ourselves? Do we actually have social and emotional welfare? Do we know how to be happy? These are incredibly important things. Leadership, and I should add to that communication. And of course, scholarship. And scholarship means knowing how to learn. And one of the key things about knowing how to learn is being an independent learner and not always being told what to do. So I think if we go back and we think about the examination certificate that we get, does it capture all of these things or not? And of course the answer would be no. And this is going to lead us on to what philosophers say about education. And I'm going to start with Socrates, who many people would see as the kind of grandfather of philosophy, the great Greek philosopher. And before he was, he was condemned to death in ancient Greece, he famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. That's a controversial thing. I'm going to spend about a minute thinking about that. The unexamined life is not worth living. What does he mean? He means that we have to actually decide what are we here for? Why does life have value? Why are we behaving in the way we are? And in order to do that, we need a degree of education. And this is something that I'm going to link to the idea of enrichment in a moment. The idea that education should be enriching, that it should be a journey. Now, the second philosopher, and uh, he's also extremely famous, is Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote about many things. He invented many of the classifications of modern science, he wrote a huge amount about ethics, and he was very interested in the idea of education. And what Aristotle said was, the goal of life, the reason why we're put on this planet, is to achieve what he called eudaimonia. Okay? And that can be translated as success, but I much prefer the term flourishing, because it makes us think about ourselves as something organic and growing. And Aristotle felt that in order to flourish, an absolutely key aspect of our lives was education. And that it was education that helped us grow. It helped us grow our minds. It helped us become engaged. It helps us become better people. And I'm going to be arguing today that to achieve eudaimonia in education, we have to think of education as a form of enrichment, as so much more once again, than a set of examination results and the idea that education is simply a set of competences. And the next thing I'm going to do is, in a moment, I'm going to show you a very short clip from the University of Oxford. And it deals with what kind of student that they're looking for. Now, many of you will immediately think, I'm not going to go to Oxford. This is a very elitist place. It's not for many of us. And that's true. But I've chosen this video because it shows that at the top university in the world, rather than emphasizing exam competence and knowledge, as you will see, they emphasize passion, curiosity, and the idea of being dedicated to your subject. And this is going to link into my theme today of enrichment and the idea that education has to go beyond simply being good at something. 
it's got to also entail being really engaged and interested. This is part three of the official guide where we'll explain how you can prepare to apply for undergraduate study at Oxford. There are many things you can do to prepare for your application to Oxford, even at an early stage. Our top tip is to explore your favourite subjects beyond schoolwork. Be curious and stretch your thinking. Find inspiration for your personal statement and interview, not just through books, but anything around you. Podcasts, magazines, the news, TV and documentaries. Remember to read up on admissions test advice and try past papers. To prepare for interviews, talk about your subject to anyone who will listen, even the cat. Articulating your thoughts can really help and make you feel more confident. Now, what we see from the Oxford application video is the idea that they're looking for, as I said, this passion and curiosity. The kind of student who reads well beyond the syllabus, the student who listens to podcasts, who reads magazine articles, who sees the bigger picture and who's able to talk about these things all of the time. Now, what better place to get that kind of knowledge than within the enrichment societies? And as the year goes on, you're going to find out more about the societies. We have law societies, philosophy societies, economic societies, etc. And in these societies, you will do wider reading and you will have the opportunity of giving lectures and becoming an expert in different aspects of uh, your particular discipline. I'm going to give an example. Um, that I had over the holiday. I was speaking to a top lawyer in Dubai and I asked him what advice he would give students who wanted to go into law. And he said the most important aspect of his education was the model United Nations. Now many of you will know what this is, but if you don't know, you'll know you, the, in, the key idea of the model United Nations is that you adopt a country and it may be a country that you don't like, and you will have to argue a particular kind of policy. And in doing this, you will learn research skills, you'll learn communication skills, you'll have to de uh, deliver speeches in front of large audiences. And most importantly, you'll learn what I call real, uh, real world learning. This idea of actually applying your knowledge in a genuine situation. And when you think about this, this is exactly what lawyers will go on to do, to argue points of view with a live audience. They may not always agree with their clients, for instance, but they're there to represent them. So I hope you can see the value of the idea of enrichment. And also, of course, many of the students will tell you these activities are incredibly enjoyable. Now I'm going to move on to the idea of 21st century skills. These are spoken about very often, and people talk about the fact that education needs to change in order to keep uh, a pace with an extremely fast-changing, dynamic world. And some of the key 20th century skills that are mentioned all of the time are the following. You could just pause the screencast now and have a look at these and talk some of them through. I hope you have the chance to talk about those and to get a sense of what these 21st century skills are. As you can see, they are very numerous. And the one that I'm going to concentrate on today is the one that's first in the list. And it's first in virtually every list that talks about the most important skills in education and in particular what we could call 21st century learning. And that's the idea of critical thinking. Now, you might have a vague idea of what critical thinking is. If you want to find out more, there's an excellent website. Uh, it's called the Foundation for Critical Thinking. And they have various exercises and they have different definitions of what critical thinking is. But I'm going to pause and have a look at what they define as absolutely key to a well-cultivated critical thinker. They say that a well-cultivated critical thinker raises vital questions, that they gather and assess relevant information, 
that they have well-reasoned conclusions. If we go back, we'll remember that that seems to be in accord with our philosopher friend Socrates, who wanted us to examine our lives and to think through the conclusions that we come to. They say that it's important to be open-minded, and I think this is a key one, to question assumptions. So much of what we assume to be true isn't actually proven, and in many cases there aren't good reasons to believe in things. So the critical thinker will try and deconstruct normal knowledge in this particular way and actually look and decide, are there reasons to believe in this particular phenomenon? And of course, the well-cultivated critical thinker communicates effectively and finds solutions to complex problems. And I think that, in, from my point of view, this problem-solving um, ability is perhaps the most important aspect of critical thinking. And I hope that you'll see now the connection to the idea of enrichment activities, where you are in real-life problem-solving situations and you are applying your knowledge. Now, the next thing I want to do is to move to the question of IQ tests, because I believe that this is going to show critical thinking. Now, to get us thinking about this question of IQ tests, IQ stands for Intelligence Quotient, I want to ask you a few questions and get you to have a discussion. Now, you could have this in groups, it's up to your tutor, or you could have this as a whole class. And here's some questions for you to think about. What are IQ tests? What are they for? What are they used for? Do they work? Uh, are the IQ tests biased? And if so, in what ways? Do you have any personal experiences of them? Or have you read stuff about them? And here's a more philosophical question for you to think about. Is intelligence fixed? Or is our brain like our muscles? Is it able to grow and become more toned with greater education? So I'm now going to pause the screencast and ask you to think about this and have a discussion about it. Now, once again, I'm not going to provide you with answers to these because there really aren't any. We'll have very many different views. The idea is to get you thinking in a critical way about some of the assumptions behind IQ tests. And now I'm going to give you your own little IQ test. So three questions are set here. And we're going to give you no more than eight minutes to think about these. So I'm going to ask your tutor to make sure that you can all see these questions. Don't have any discussions yet. This is you on your own. You're looking at these three questions here. And I'm going to pause the screen now and give you a chance to see how good your IQ is. Now, I hope you were able to do those three questions. I'm more of an arts. English style student, so I found them very difficult, although I did work through them. And in this case, unlike some of the earlier discussion questions, which were open questions, subjective questions, that could have multiple interpretations, these three questions are the kind of question from an IQ test where there is only one answer which is accepted. And I'm going to give you the answers now. So for the first one, John will be 16. For the second question, in which you were looking at the uh, bowling families and who had these little tasty snacks, the answer is $20.61. And for the third question, which is the missing number from the sequence, the missing number is 49. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the calculations for that. You could have a quick discussion with it if you're interested. I'm using these to show the difference between the kind of questions you might get in more art subjects, which are subjective, and the idea of the IQ test where there is a set answer to the question. Okay. Now, what are some of the assumptions behind IQ tests? Well, the IQ test seems to believe that intelligence is fixed and that it's biological, that we're born with that. There's also the assumption that the IQ can be measured and that the tests can do this fairly and objectively 
by answering questions that show your reasoning ability and problem-solving ability. You will notice that IQ tests are usually very numerical or very shape-orientated because they eliminate the need for subjectivity and the possibility of multiple answers. Okay. And as I said, yes, very much about problem solving. And there's also the assumption uh, in IQ tests that people with a high IQ will do well. They'll do well at school and they're going to go on to do really well in life. And that the IQ is almost like a kind of prophecy of what it is that you're going to achieve. Now, in a moment, I'm going to be showing you a really interesting video from TEDx. But I will also tell you that there's a dark side to IQ tests, as you're going to see. And this is the idea of connecting it to what we call eugenics. And eugenics is a set of beliefs and practices that believe that we can improve people biologically through selective breeding. So that if we get all the clever people together and we get them to have children together, maybe those children will be more intelligent. We saw this uh, belief very much in Nazi thinking, where there was this idea of a Hürdenfolk or a master race that could be selectively bred. Now, I'm going to be showing you a video. It's called The Dark History of IQ Tests, and it's by uh, Stefan Dombrowski over here. And it's going to show you some of the history of IQ tests. I think you'll find this really interesting because it will help your critical analysis of what it is that was behind the assumptions and the origins of the IQ test. Some of the things you may not know. I hope you enjoy this. In 1905, psychologists Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon designed a test for children who were struggling in school in France. Designed to determine which children required individualized attention, their method formed the basis of the IQ test. Beginning in the late 19th century, researchers hypothesized that cognitive abilities like verbal reasoning, working memory, and visual spatial skills reflected an underlying general intelligence, or G-factor. Simone and Binet designed a battery of tests to measure each of these abilities and combine the results into a single score. Questions were adjusted for each age group, and a child's score reflected how they performed relative to others their age. Dividing someone's score by their age and multiplying the result by 100 yielded the intelligence quotient, or IQ. Today, a score of 100 represents the average of a sample population, with 68% of the population scoring within 15 points of 100. Simone and Binet thought the skills their test assessed would reflect general intelligence. But both then and now, there's no single agreed-upon definition of general intelligence. And that left the door open for people to use the test in service of their own preconceived assumptions about intelligence. What started as a way to identify those who needed academic help quickly became used to sort people in other ways, often in service of deeply flawed ideologies. One of the first large-scale implementations occurred in the United States during World War I, when the military used an IQ test to sort recruits and screen them for officer training. At that time, many people believed in eugenics, the idea that desirable and undesirable genetic traits could and should be controlled in humans through selective breeding. There were many problems with this line of thinking, among them the idea that intelligence was not only fixed and inherited, but also linked to a person's race. Under the influence of eugenics, scientists used the results of the military initiative to make erroneous claims that certain racial groups were intellectually superior to others. Without taking into account that many of the recruits tested were new immigrants to the United States who lacked formal education or English language exposure, they created an erroneous intelligence hierarchy of ethnic groups. The intersection of eugenics and IQ testing influenced not only science, but policy as well. In 1924, the state of Virginia created policy 
allowing for the forced sterilization of people with low IQ scores, a decision the United States Supreme Court upheld. In Nazi Germany, the government authorized the murder of children based on low IQ. Following the Holocaust and the Civil Rights Movement, the discriminatory uses of IQ tests were challenged on both moral and scientific grounds. Scientists began to gather evidence of environmental impacts on IQ. For example, as IQ tests were periodically recalibrated over the 20th century, new generations scored consistently higher on old tests than each previous generation. This phenomenon, known as the Flynn effect, happened much too fast to be caused by inherited evolutionary traits. Instead, the cause was likely environmental, improved education, better health care, and better nutrition. In the mid-20th century, psychologists also attempted to use IQ tests to evaluate things other than general intelligence, particularly schizophrenia, depression, and other psychiatric conditions. These diagnoses relied in part on the clinical judgment of the evaluators and used a subset of the tests used to determine IQ, a practice later research found does not yield clinically useful information. Today, IQ tests employ many similar design elements and types of questions as the early tests, though we have better techniques for identifying potential bias in the test. They're no longer used to diagnose psychiatric conditions, but a similarly problematic practice using subtest scores is still sometimes used to diagnose learning disabilities against the advice of many experts. Psychologists around the world still use IQ tests to identify intellectual disability, and the results can be used to determine appropriate educational support, job training, and assisted living. IQ test results have been used to justify horrific policies and scientifically baseless ideologies. That doesn't mean the test itself is worthless. In fact, it does a good job of measuring the reasoning and problem-solving skills it sets out to. But that isn't the same thing as measuring a person's potential. Though there are many complicated political, historical, scientific, and cultural issues wrapped up in IQ testing, more and more researchers agree on this point and reject the notion that individuals can be categorized by a single numerical Right, I hope you found that interesting. Just to check your level of understanding, I'm going to give you a quick multiple choice test. Now, if you have time, you could write down the answers or just commit them to memory, whichever you prefer. Question number one. Intelligence tests were used by the US military during World War I for what purpose? To create a master race? To determine who had officer potential? To determine whether women should enter the military? or to determine the max, maximum age to be drafted. Question number two. Intelligence tests were originally created by Alfred Benet and Theodore Simon for what purpose? To determine which race was intellectually superior, to determine who should spend, become a military officer or a private on the front lines, to determine which groups of people were genetically superior, or to determine who could benefit from education? Question number three. Which of the following statements about IQ tests is inaccurate? During the 1920s, it was thought that IQ tests could be used to make decisions about individuals who should be sterilized. During the 1920s, it was thought that IQ tests could determine which groups of people were genetically superior. During the 1920s, it was thought that IQ tests yielded results that were predominantly genetically determined, fixed, and immutable. During the 1920s, tests were used to predict who might run for president. And now on to question number four. In the past, IQ tests have been used inappropriately for which purpose? Placement on athletic teams, to determine hair color, to diagnose depression and other psychiatric conditions, and D, to determine who might be a good parent. And finally, question number five, which of uh, the following is an appropriate use for the IQ test? A, determine who should receive a classification of intellectual disability. 
B, determine who should receive a classification of learning disabilities. C, determine who is destined for a life full of success. And D, determine who is likely to receive a psychiatric classification such as depression or ADHD. I'll stop it there. Right, now to the answers, going through them quite quickly. So question number one. Intelligence tests were used by the US military during World War I for, well, to de determine who had officer potential. So again, the critical thinker immediately would think, is this the best way of working out how we choose officers in the army? Question number two. IQ tests were originally developed by Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon for what purpose? And it was to determine who could benefit from education. Very controversial there. Which of the following statements about IQ tests is inaccurate? And it's D. During the 1920s, IQ tests were used to predict who might run for president. So at least they weren't used for that. But they were used for this very dark purpose here to see who was genetically superior. And I want to take you back to this idea of genetics and eugenics. This idea that we could have a master race. So again, that's why the video is called The Dark History of the IQ Test. Um, number four. In the past, IQ tests have been used inappropriately for what purpose? And that was to diagnose depression and other psychiatric conditions. So again, I want you to pause and think as a critical thinker now. How disturbing that an IQ test would be used to determine psychiatric conditions. Finally, number five, which of the following is an appropriate use for the IQ test? And they say to determine who should receive a classification of an intellectual disability. I want to stop there now, because this is not my answer. This is the answer that comes from the TEDx website. And again, as a critical thinker, I want you to think really carefully about that. We're gonna use the IQ test for intellectual disability. But first reason, I'm a little bit reticent about this is I don't like the word disability itself. And secondly, the IQ test might only be one measure of finding out intellectual disability if such a thing exists. So the reason why I chose the IQ test was I find it has such a disturbing history and was used so inappropriately. And it seems to me a great topic to get students to think about how they judged and how educators make decisions about people's ability and the way in which they use assessments. And one of my great heroes, not only because he shares my name, is Professor James Flynn. And he is the world's greatest expert on IQ tests. I very strongly recommend that you get, if you get the chance, you go on the internet and you watch his TED talk, which is excellent. And what James Flynn comes up with is the idea of what he calls the what has become known as the Flynn effect. And that is, as you can see across the world, that IQ has gone up massively in recent years. And what James Flynn argues is that IQ will go up when education goes up. So the idea that IQ is something fixed and biological, James Flynn says, is a terrible travesty of an idea and that in fact IQ is closely linked to education. And that takes us to the debate of that many of you will be familiar with of nature versus nurture. Of course the idea of nature is that things are determined genetically, they're fixed. It doesn't really matter what the social conditions are etc. And the opposite idea would be that human beings are made by social conditions and the environment. When we think about IQ tests and we think about how important it is in terms of judging people's ability and intelligence, are we on the nature side that IQ is fixed or are we on the nurture side that IQ will be produced at least partly by social conditions that human beings are brought up in? Why is this important? Well, this is a genuine IQ classification scale that was used in the United States in the 1920s. 
And I want you to look at some of the terms that were used for people. Coma, idiot, imbecile, moron, deficient, and normal. This is extremely disturbing when we think that this is the kind of language that educators would be using. And what would the effect be on teachers' relationships with students if that is the way that they viewed them? Now, you might be asking yourself, well, how does this affect me? Mr. Flynn's been talking about things that no longer occur. Well, don't forget, even to this day, in schools, the CAT4 test is used. Again, a cognitive ability test, not too dissimilar from the old IQ test. And this test is used to predict students' grade outcomes and their ability. And so you may or may not know, and some of you have done a number of CAT tests and some of you are about to do one, that the CAT4 test is divided into verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, nonverbal reasoning, and spatial ability. And the results of this test are used to determine what we believe your future grades are. Now, this video is not a criticism of that. It is simply asking you to think about the ways in which we judge ability and the ways in which we use tests and assessments to arrive at that particular judgment. Now, there's a very interesting theorist at Harvard University called Howard Gardner, and he came up with the theory of multiple intelligences. And he's very critical of things like the IQ test and the CAT test because he argues that intelligence comes in so many different forms. He calls it naturalistic, for instance, okay? And that's when you love animals, etc. He talks about visual and spatial intelligence, musical intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, logical intelligence, linguistic intelligence. One of the ones that's missing from my diagram here is kinesthetic intelligence. And that would be the intelligence of a great sports person a person who is able to uh, you know, manipulate hand-eye coordination and show brilliance and intelligence in that department. So going back to the idea of critical thinking about the IQ test, when we get grades that measure you on graphs like this, scatter graphs, etc., will it take into account all of your abilities? And that's the question you need to ask yourself. Would such a test be able to uh, identify the genius of Pablo Picasso as a painter? Would it be able to identify the genius of William Shakespeare, who many people consider to be the greatest writer in the English language? Would the CAT test or the IQ test be able to identify Mozart, who many people would see as one of the greatest composers of all time? And I think the, the answer to that is something that you need to think about very carefully. And so we come back to the question of critical thinking in action. And I hope this has given you a sense of an overview of how critical thinking is not accepting things. Even when people in authority with very impressive qualifications speak of things like IQ tests, it's our duty as thinkers as people who believe that education is about enrichment and about critical thinking, not to take what they say on surface value, but to question it and to put a lot of their assumptions to the test. Now, how does this relate to my role in DESK? Well, as I said earlier, I'm head of the extended project qualification, the EPQ. And what we believe in DESK is that the EPQ will give you the ability to show creativity, resilience, research skills, and the critical thinking that you saw today. It will refine your communication and your writing skills. And most of all, the EPQ is about real world learning. That means going out into the world and interviewing people, finding things out, seeing that what you're studying in the classroom applies to the world that exists around you. And so to return to what this talk is all about is the value of education as enrichment. 
so that you no longer see education as a way simply of passing exams, but something that is really interesting and empowering to you. And this is what universities are looking for. They're looking for students who are engaged, who are curious, and who manifest critical thinking in their work. Now, to bring it all together, I'm going to quickly show you the, uh, the wall that is outside my office. And I thought very carefully about this before I designed it. And what I try to show you is that there's so much available in this college, which is about enrichment. Whether it's the Lambda exams you're doing, whether it's the plays and drama, whether it's the city and guilds certificates, the Trinity certificates you might be doing in music, whether it's films you're making in media, whether it's robotics and STEM societies that are in the school, whether it's world scholars or debating, whether you're doing uh, Coursera courses and future learn courses online or listening to audible courses, whether you're doing academic research using some of our databases and doing an EPQ, whether it's the reading of external newspapers and magazine articles, or whether you're doing something like the Duke of Edinburgh or belonging to an environmental society, you have to find a way to make sure that your education is about enrichment. And that is something that I hope that this lecture has accomplished for you. I'm always free to discuss the whole idea of enrichment with you and how to make your university application as competitive as possible. And I very much hope that you enjoy your time here in the college and that you do find your education enriching. Thanks for listening.